800 BC. It is the dawn of a new age in Britain, one dominated by items wrought in iron. With these new tools, the chieftains of Britain would divide the land between them, carving out petty kingdoms and nations. From these bases, they would wage unceasing wars, whilst also forming new trade partnerships with the tribes of Gaul. But their very success would prove their undoing. By the turn of the millennium, their neighbours would fall under the sway of a new power. In 55 BC, its presence would be felt in Britain, as a foreign army lands on its shores for the very first time. The collapse of the bronze networks of ancient Britain had vast consequences for its people. Over the preceding millennium, the emergence of bronze as the preferred tool-making material had led to a revolution in society. Arriving first alongside the migration of the Beaker people into Britain and Ireland, bronze axes soon laid waste to Britain's ancient woodland. The next few centuries saw much of Britain parceled up into mass farming systems. Elite groups emerged, supported by their hoarding of luxury bronze goods. Then, around 1200 BC, the climate in Britain would start to deteriorate. In the newly deforested uplands, increased rainfall would render farming all but impossible, whilst in the lowlands, peat growth would overrun vast swathes of agricultural land. Soon after, the vast Atlantic bronze networks would come to an end, and all over Britain, the material that had once formed the very core of society was now being carefully thrown away. To many archaeologists, the late Bronze Age in Britain is synonymous with decline. This was most reflected with the collapse of the complex field systems seen around Dartmoor and the Thames Valley, and the vast hordes of bronze items deposited in rivers and lakes. During this time, it is theorised that Britain's population may have fallen, with its remaining citizens being forced together into shrinking areas of agricultural land. The native bronze production around which life had once revolved was slowly being abandoned in favour of recycling and continental exports. Meanwhile, the elite status these items would have once conferred was slowly being eroded in favour of communal displays of feasting and excess. And across the continent, a new technology is looming, one that will transform the lives of the British people as much as bronze before it. Truly, it seemed like the end of an era. Historians have often found it easier to simplify prehistory into distinct periods. The most common of these is based on the dominant tool-making materials of the day. If we follow this system, then the Stone Age in Britain ended around four and a half thousand years ago, when the first metal tools arrived alongside the Beaker migration into Britain and Ireland. This metalworking period began with the Bronze Age, which lasted for most of the next two millennia, and which saw the arrival of first copper and then bronze tools. Around 800 BC, this era in turn gave way to the superior tools of the Iron Age, which lasted roughly until the Roman conquest in the 1st century AD. The result is a simple system, one that works well in the confines of a museum display or a textbook. But the reality is that it took many centuries for both bronze and iron to become widespread in Britain. In the case of iron, the earliest known tools appeared during the 8th century BC, comprising part 
of the Flynn Vower Horde. In their construction, these early tools were deliberately crafted to resemble their bronze precursors, retaining elements in their design that the stronger iron simply didn't need. And despite this early appearance, iron tools simply don't appear in large quantities in the archaeological record until what we would term the Mid-Iron Age. And in the time in between, society would change greatly in Britain and Ireland. One way that this change can be seen is in just how this new metal was used. By all accounts, iron seems to have been considered a more mundane material than the bronze that preceded it. Its ore was much more widespread than either copper or tin, and iron tools are likely to have been produced by local smiths rather than at fixed mining sites. Perhaps due to its wider availability, iron never seems to have attained the ritual importance of bronze, though it would find its way into many elite items in the centuries ahead. Still, none of these facts can obscure the advantages of iron. Compared to bronze, it is stronger, more flexible, and easier both to produce and to repair. So how did ironworking arrive in Britain? Was it a purely homegrown affair, or did it make its way into Britain like bronze before it, on the back of a migration? Well, as far as historians of the early 20th century were concerned, the story of iron's arrival in Britain was simple. So simple, in fact, that it can be summed up in just one word. Invasion. Evidence of this supposed invasion has been found across Northern Britain and Ireland in the form of a new type of bronze sword that became popular during the first half of the 8th century BC. This sword, known as the Gundlingen sword, was also widely adopted throughout Central and Eastern Europe by the chieftains of the Hallstatt culture. This culture, which emerged from around 800 BC, was characterised by the appearance of a horse-riding aristocracy, who buried their elites in timber barrows containing large numbers of weapons and high prestige goods. Older theories pointed to the appearance of this Gundlingen sword in the British archaeological record around this time, alongside copious amounts of horse harnesses as evidence of an invasion by this warrior elite. This invasion would have replaced much of the native population, and led to the introduction of ironworking new cultural practices, and perhaps most significantly, a new family of languages. This idea of a Celtic invasion remains well established in popular culture to this day. At first glance, this theory might seem logical. After all, bronze working in Britain was likely brought to these shores by a similar migration, that of the Beaker people in the mid-third millennium BC. But modern archaeologists now reject most elements of this theory. We now know that the Gundlingen sword was only briefly popular in Central Europe, and by the middle of the 8th century BC, it was replaced in Hallstatt burials by the Iron Mindelheim sword. If this invasion scenario were true, then we might expect to find examples of this sword appearing in similar burials across Britain. However, only one example has been found as part of the Flynn Vower Horde. For whatever reason, the people of Britain chose to hold on to their bronze swords for at least another couple of centuries. And instead of being buried with them, they did what people in Britain had been doing for a millennium. They deposited them in rivers and lakes. Most archaeologists now consider the emergence of ironworking in Britain to have been fed more by trade and cultural diffusion than by invasion. Indeed, it is right around 500 BC, when iron tools become established in Britain, that new trade links were being forged between southeastern England and central Europe. With them, these links would bring a new, elite form of metalworking that would one day culminate in homegrown masterpieces of Celtic art. Alongside it came other types of luxury goods, around which much of southern England would come to revolve in the centuries ahead. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. First, 
let's take a look at what life was like in Britain during the earliest Iron Age, right around 800 BC. After centuries of decline, the climate of Britain was beginning to improve. In eastern Britain, the deposition of bronze hordes in lakes and rivers slowly fizzled out, continuing in a reduced fashion in southwestern England and Wales. Over the next two centuries, the population expanded. New farmsteads began to appear, this time focused on large, circular houses. In form, these round houses were similar to those of their Bronze Age precursors, but often their scale is more reminiscent of medieval halls than of family dwellings. Reconstructions have shown that some of these roundhouses were so large that they may have had upper floors, or at least roof lofts in which valuable commodities could have been stored. No doubt some of these sites were occupied by more than one family, and the special care and attention with which many were placed within their communities give a clear sign of prestigious individuals dwelling within. At the same time, these buildings retain many of the ceremonial aspects of the Bronze Age. In almost all cases their entrances point eastward, towards the rising sun. Most appear to have been the sites of communal feasts similar to those of the late Bronze Age, and it is around the same time as these large roundhouses are emerging that an old idea reappears in Britain. Hilltop enclosures had first appeared in Britain during the 4th millennium BC, in the form of the causeway enclosures. These sites, which may have acted as tribal meeting grounds for trade or ritual worship, flourished for centuries before their construction halted around 3000 BC. Now, over 2000 years later, this idea began to return to Britain. Between the years of 900 and 600 BC, simple enclosures started to appear on hilltops across southern and central England. An early example of these enclosures can be found at Walbury Hill, where a simple bank and ditch still encloses an area of some 33 hectares. This combination of impressive size and weak defences is common amongst this type of early enclosure, which are thought to have acted as corrals for large herds of sheep and cattle. This hypothesis is supported by the lack of internal structures found within many of these enclosures, which often seem to have contained little more than lightly built shelters. Instead, people may have used these sites to seasonally round up their flocks for sorting, castration and culling, events that may have been timed to intersect with rituals and mass feasting. These communal farms and enclosures are a snapshot of a society not too different from that of the late Bronze Age. But for the people of Britain, the world awaiting them in the centuries ahead is far less egalitarian. Indeed, by the middle of the first millennium BC, we see new hierarchies and regional cultures emerging across much of Britain. The seas of this can already be seen by the Middle Iron Age, when a second category of hilltop structures began to emerge. Some of these can still be seen today in places like Highdown Hill in West Sussex, where a small, rectangular enclosure was constructed around 600 BC. These areas are distinguished by the presence of extensive fortifications, and excavations of their interiors have shown a large amount of debris associated with intensive occupation. Compared to the larger enclosures, these sites are rare, but they already contain the blueprint what would become the greatest fortifications yet built in Britain. But before these new fortifications could emerge, another event would radically alter life in Britain. We spoke before of how the climate began to improve during the early Iron Age. It's not precisely agreed amongst archaeologists when ideal conditions for farming would have returned, but we do know that by 500 BC the climate crisis would have been a distant memory and right around this time, the population of Britain would explode. 
This increase in population can be attested to by the sudden jump in the number of settlements found across Britain from the Mid-Iron Age onwards. In addition to the improved climate, it is now widely agreed that the second half of the first millennium saw the arrival of several inventions, the combination of which helped to fuel this population boom. The first is one we've already mentioned, the widespread adoption of iron tools from around 500 BC. By fitting an iron blade to the simple ploughs that characterised Bronze Age farming, preparing a field would have suddenly been both quicker and less labour intensive. Around the same time, the types of crops being planted in these fields were beginning to change. Wheat gave way to hardier, higher yielding crops like spelt, whilst a new type of husked barley gained popularity. Alongside traditional autumn planting, the practice of spring sowing also took hold, increasing yields and reducing the risk of crop failure. This increase in food production was enhanced further by an ingenious new storage method. Until this point, grain seems to have been stored in large, overground granaries in which it could only be held for so long before it germinated. However, at some point in the Mid-Iron Age, it was discovered that germination could be halted by storing grain below ground in large pits, which were then sealed with an airtight clay cap. This simple change meant that grain could now be stockpiled to stave off famine in the event of crop failure. It may even have become a currency of sorts, as powerful tribes would have hoarded vast quantities of grain with which to bail out their neighbours in return for submission. And finally, the appearance of another piece of technology during the Middle Iron Age would remove much of the labour that converting this grain into food had previously involved. For millennia, the saddle quern had been an essential part of British food production. It's comprised of a large saddle-shaped stone against which grain would be ground into a form of coarse flour. Whilst effective, proper grinding would have taken many hours to complete, and the crouched position it required would have been crippling for the person using it. But somewhere between the 5th and the 4th centuries BC, a more efficient design emerged in Britain. Known as the rotary or beehive quern, this new design comprised of two circular stones, each with a hole in the centre, loosely mounted on top of each other. Using a wooden handle, the upper stone could be rotated on top of the lower. Grain could then be poured through the central hole, where it would be ground into flour between the two surfaces. Quicker and less backbreaking, this new design would have greatly reduced the workload of the average farmer. These innovations, combined with another that we will come to shortly, vastly increased the population capacity of Britain. As always, precise estimates of population are difficult to make, but in the 1500 years between the Late Bronze Age and the Late Iron Age, the population of the British Isles may have tripled to around 1.5 million. Perhaps two thirds of this total was concentrated in England, mostly in the prosperous lands of the South and the West. And with this increase also came vast changes in society. Simply put, this larger population seems to have led to increased competition in Britain, as expanding farmland would have forced once distant tribes into closer proximity with their neighbours. These tensions had likely been rising since the Middle Bronze Age, as shown by an increase of weapons like daggers, halberds and swords in the archaeological record. Shields also appeared in Britain during this time, and armour and helmets made of leather would have been common amongst the Bronze Age warrior elite. By the Middle Iron Age, however, increased competition for control of territory and arable land led to the normalisation of what may have until now been a relatively rare occurrence – war. We'll talk in detail about Iron Age warfare soon. But first, if we want to understand what these conflicts would have involved, we need to look at a new type of fortification that appears around this time across southern Britain, one that seems to have risen organically as a response to these increasingly violent times. Unique to the British Isles, the hill forts first begin to appear around 500 BC. 
smaller than their hill enclosure precursors, but larger than the fortifications seen at High Down Hill. Most early hill forts would have consisted of a single ditch, protected by a steep rampart faced out with either stone or wood. Most had two distinct entrances, which were in turn guarded by large gatehouses and elaborate earthworks. Unlike the hill enclosures, excavations of their interiors indicate that many were subject to dense, continuous occupation. Evidence for streets, granaries, and even shrines has been found within their walls, while storage pits numbering in the hundreds have been unearthed from beneath them. Over the next two centuries, many of these sites would see their interiors enlarged, with new lines of banks and fortifications being dug and iterated on. In modern times, erosion has reduced these once sheer walls to more gentle slopes. But even now, two and a half millennia later, these hill forts still give the impression of dominating their surrounding landscapes. But was this their actual purpose? Given the elaborate defences seen at many sites, it might seem a foregone conclusion that their function was a defensive one, with each fort acting as a centralised sanctuary for their communities in times of strife, or as bases from which local rulers could plan battles and raids upon their neighbours. But you may be surprised to learn that the exact purpose of these early hill forts is controversial amongst archaeologists. Almost all agree that early hill forts were a reaction to an increasingly violent society, brought on by increased population density. But increasingly, it is becoming clear that these sites would have fulfilled multiple functions. Some may well have acted as bases for local kings and warlords, but others could have been designed with a more communal role in mind. Almost all hill forts seem to have acted as stockpiles for grain and cattle, as shown by the large amount of manure and storage pits found within their interior. Others may also have acted as religious sites, as shown by the presence of larger buildings or shrines within their centres. This is supported by the dual entrances seen at many hill forts, which may have been used for ritual processions similar to those of the Bronze Age. Finally, there may also have been an element of prestige involved in the construction of these sites, as seen by the increasingly elaborate fortifications at sites like Maiden Castle in Dorset. Simply put, the mere impression of power and impregnability may have been more important in securing a territory than actual defensive capabilities. This focus on prestige also seems to have extended to early warfare in Britain. Whilst it remains impossible to know for sure, the limited archaeological record, along with classical accounts of warfare amongst the peoples of Gaul and Northern Europe, indicates that all-out warfare would have been a rarity in early Iron Age Britain. That's not to say that conflicts weren't commonplace, but if we go by the examples of their European neighbours, then they seem to have taken the form of frequent raids against specific settlements or hill forts. The exact nature of these raids would have varied greatly depending on the circumstances, but it seems that direct attacks on hill forts were rare until the late Iron Age. Instead, most incursions seem to have been designed to establish the social positions of individual war leaders and chieftains, along with increasing the prestige and the plunder of the tribe itself. Occasionally, more traditional battle lines may have emerged, but even here, display and prestige would have helped dictate the outcome. Often it seems that these conflicts would have emphasised ritual contests between champions, with a general melee only occurring if these contests proved indecisive. This increased emphasis on display can also be seen in the arrival of a new vehicle from the continent. First emerging during the 5th century BC, the war chariot was soon to become an integral part of British warfare. These vehicles were by no means a recent development. Horse-drawn carts had first appeared around the second half of the 4th millennium BC, either on the steppes of Eurasia or on the floodplains of Mesopotamia. By the early 2nd millennium BC, they had evolved into recognisable spoke-wheeled chariots. By 1500 BC, they were appearing in quantity 
throughout the eastern Mediterranean. It took nearly a millennium for them to reach Western Europe, but only a couple of centuries later they would become widespread across most of southern and eastern Britain. The use of chariots by the native British is widely attested to by both the archaeological record and later written sources. Chariot fittings and harnesses start to appear in quantity all over Britain from around the late 5th century BC, with their number intensifying in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. Similar vehicles appeared in Ireland, where they would remain in use for nearly a millennium. Chariots also figure prominently in accounts of Britain written by classical authors, many of whom found its use by the natives to be quaint. By this time, both the Greeks and the Romans had long since consigned the chariot to more ceremonial and sporting roles, its use in warfare having been superseded by newer forms of cavalry. To these authors, its use would have seemed archaic, a relic of an era dating back to the legendary Trojan War. But when it comes to the only significant first-hand account that we have of their use in battle, it's clear that those who faced chariots in person had a far greater appreciation for their effectiveness. This account comes to us from none other than Julius Caesar, who encountered chariots on his two expeditions to Britain in the mid-first century BC. By this time, the vehicles he encountered would have been light, spoked affairs, from which riding platforms would have hung by a series of leather straps. This simple form of suspension would have allowed the chariot to act as a mobile weapons platform, from which their occupants could ride along enemy lines and challenge their rivals, or else hurl missiles into their midst. And if we go by Caesar's account, the Britons soon developed tactics to make the most effective use of these weapons. Quote, These are the tactics of chariot warfare. First, they drive in all directions hurling spears. Generally, they succeed in throwing the ranks of their enemies into confusion just with the terror caused by their galloping horses and the din of the wheels. They make their way through the squadrons of their own cavalry, then jump down from their chariots and fight on foot. Meanwhile, the chariot drivers withdraw a little way from the fighting and position the chariots in such a way that if their masters are hard pressed by the enemy's numbers, they have an easy means of retreat to their own lines. Thus, when they fight, they have the mobility of cavalry and the staying power of infantry. The sight of these battles must have been quite the spectacle. In addition to their chariots, these warrior elites would have gone into battle equipped in their best iron weapons and fine leather armour, accompanied by the sound of massed war horns carried by the rank and file. For all the interest these southern war zones inspire, it is unlikely that conflicts on this scale were a part of everyday life for most of Britain's denizens. That's not to say that raids and violence were restricted to southern Britain, but when we look elsewhere, to the north and the west, we see very different societal patterns emerging. Whilst hill fortifications are known throughout the rest of Britain, the elaborate sites of southern and western England are conspicuously absent. In their place lie separate regional identities, many of them with their own forms of societal organisation. By the 5th century BC, these differences had become large enough that Britain could be separated into distinct zones. In the southern and central parts of Britain, we see the hill forts, a development that was also common throughout the eastern and southern parts of Scotland. In eastern England, however, comparatively few fortifications have been found, and much of the landscape is taken up by lightly defended farmsteads and villages. These settlements are similarly dominant north of the Humber, though here they tend to be found upland, set within small, defensive enclosures. The final western zone runs up through Cornwall, into the western parts of Wales, and then finally through much of western Scotland. Here settlements are characterised by heavy defensive structures, which vary widely by region and terrain. And it is in this part of Britain that a set of structures were built that gave the hill forts a run for their money. 
Around the Middle Iron Age, massive dry stone towers began to be erected along the coast of Scotland. Known as the Brocks, many of these structures once stood in excess of 30 feet tall, though few now retain more than a fraction of their original height. Like the hill forts of southeastern Scotland, their great height and thickly built walls give an impression of brute power, from which their owners would have dominated the local coastline. It is unsurprising then that earlier archaeologists saw them largely in these defensive terms. Indeed, many theorised that these unusual towers were built as sanctuaries to which the local community would flee in response to cattle raids by their neighbours. But the archaeological evidence now seems to favour a domestic role for these sites. Most brocks appear to have been permanently occupied, and despite their great height, assessments of their defensive capabilities have been mixed. Whilst all brocks are distinguished by their thick walls and the presence of guard chambers by their entrances, their doorways show no other signs of fortification, and their rough stone walls would have been easy for determined attackers to scale. The lack of windows or roof access would also have left the occupants unable to fire missiles down at their opponents, not to mention blind to their attackers' movements. In fact, it is now thought that the sheer height of these brocks may instead have been intended as a form of display by their occupants, who would have competed with their neighbours to erect ever higher towers. As impressive as they are, these towers are far from the only type of homestead found in these regions. Related single-storey buildings, such as stone wheelhouses or small fortified duns, can be found throughout this western zone. Scotland and Ireland were also home to another set of structures altogether. Known as the Cranogs, they first appeared during the Late Stone Age, and it is during the Iron Age that their construction reached their peak. Most of these structures consisted of an artificial wooden island built on long stilts above the waters of lakes and locks. These ingenious structures would have been well placed to exploit commercial waterways in their regions, along with all the raw resources that the lakes themselves would have provided. It is possible to see these different building patterns as being reflective of the different pressures these societies would have faced. This is correct in a general sense, as few other societies in Britain seem to have experienced the same level of warfare as southern England. But even in areas without hill forts, there are still signs of violence. This can be seen in the large numbers of fortified sites that can be found throughout Wales and western Scotland, along with the copious number of warrior burials unearthed in areas such as northern England and Yorkshire. These tensions only increased as the centuries went by. During the 4th and the 3rd centuries BC, the early hill forts of the south give way to a smaller number of more developed sites, which are more evenly spaced across their respective landscapes. In addition to this resizing, some would become the focus of increasingly frantic refortification. By the 2nd century BC, this process had culminated in the most elaborate earthworks yet seen in Britain. Alas, many of these fortifications would still prove incapable of withstanding the increased violence of these times. Signs of catastrophic fires have now been unearthed within the interiors of several hill forts. Perhaps the best example of this violence can be seen at Danebury. Here a destruction layer shows that a large fire damaged significant proportions of the interior some time in the late 4th century BC. Devastating as this event must have been for its occupants, they seem to have regrouped, and activity continued at Danebury until the 1st century BC, when another fire destroyed its gates. Only then, after five centuries of occupation, was the site finally abandoned. Further evidence of violence can be seen from the large quantities of sling stones found around the fort's entranceway, and in the marks of weaponry seen on the bones found within. In the face of this destruction, it is understandable that sites like Danebury were never reoccupied. But what is more confusing 
is that many of these later hill forts seem to have been abandoned voluntarily. You see, as we enter the 1st century BC, larger tribal kingdoms were beginning to appear in Britain. As these territories emerged, tribal borders began to move and shrink. Suddenly hill forts that had once stood between two rival tribes may have found themselves part of the same confederation, or in service to a common overlord. It is unsurprising then that some of these hill forts would have lost their strategic importance, and that the costs of maintaining them would have been judged too great. Slowly, their populations would have dwindled, as an ever greater proportion of people came to live instead in far less elaborate sites. Across the southeast, enclosed towns known as oppidums started to emerge, many of them larger and more urbanised than their hill fort precursors. By the time we reached the 1st century BC, some had dispensed with walls entirely. Many of these towns would go on to form the core of cities that are still around today, including modern Colchester and Winchester. So if these hill fort sites were no longer the key feature of British society, what was? The answer is simple. Trade. We've said little so far of how trade evolved over the course of the Iron Age. In our last episode, we covered how the bronze networks that had dominated Britain in the past had collapsed during the early 1st millennium BC, with large amounts of the material being taken out of circulation. By the early 8th century BC, however, this bronze crisis seems to have passed, and in fact there is evidence of continued trade in bronze around this time between Britain and the rest of Europe. To the south and the west of Britain, in the so-called Flynn Vower zone, we see imports of high lead axes from northwestern France, many of which continue to be deposited in votive hordes. In eastern Britain, trade links with Central Europe developed, as shown by the presence of bronze Halstatt swords and tools. Then, within only 50 years, things would change once more. Continental imports of metal items began to dry up. By 750 BC, trade with Ireland had ceased, and for the next two centuries, Britain would receive only a trickle of the goods it once knew. It's unlikely that continental trade ceased entirely during this time. Yes, the amount of metal items arriving in Britain would diminish, but this doesn't mean that trade in other, more perishable commodities such as wool or foodstuffs would have ceased. In many coastal zones, there is evidence of continental pottery styles appearing throughout the 8th and the 7th centuries BC along with limited examples of trade along the Thames Valley up until the 6th century BC. But it isn't until the beginning of the 5th century BC that large-scale trade with Europe returned, and by this time the goods on offer had changed radically. The source of these new goods appeared around 600 BC, with the founding of a Greek colony on the southern coast of France. Now the modern city of Marseille, this new settlement was soon followed by others along the coast, and marked the beginning of new trade links with the elites of Central Europe. Over the next century, a new trading zone would form from eastern France to southern Germany, with luxury Mediterranean goods appearing amongst the feasts and burials of the Hallstatt chieftains. The best example of this can be found in an elaborate burial unearthed in the village of Hochdorf in southwestern Germany. Around 530 BC, a man was laid to rest here under a six meter burial mound. Within his tomb were found elaborate grave goods, including a decorated carriage and a Greek style bronze couch and cauldron. These types of grave goods remain common within Central Europe until the beginning of the 5th century BC, after which these elite zones became more dispersed. To the west, these centres would come to focus on Bourges, Marne and Moselle, forming what was known as the Latin culture. This later set of elites was distinguished from the Hallstatt chieftains by their development of a distinctive family of artwork that reinterpreted Mediterranean designs with a more local flavour. <laughs> 
known as Celtic or Le Ten Art. This new style began to incorporate running spiral motifs that had likely been popular in Northern Europe since at least Neolithic times. And by the beginning of the 4th century BC, this artwork would take hold in Britain in a big way. As with the arrival of ironworking, the exact method by which this artwork made its way across the channel has been controversial. For a long time it was associated by historians with the latest in a series of Celtic invasions into Britain and Ireland. Indeed, it is known that around the end of the 5th century BC, the societies that had supported these elite Latin zones in Europe were collapsing, likely as a result of overpopulation. Throughout the next century, many of these peoples would migrate southwards into Italy, eastwards into the Carpathian Basin, and then on into Greece and Anatolia. These migrations are well attested to amongst ancient writers, and indeed Rome itself was sacked by one of these migrating tribes around 390 BC. But in Britain, there seems to be a distinct lack of agricultural evidence for such an invasion. Local settlement styles remain distinctly British, with people living in roundhouses rather than the square houses of the continent. What genetic evidence exists also shows strong continuity with the Bronze Age population of Britain, ruling out any theories of mass migration. Instead, this Latin art style seems to have made its way into Britain as so many other innovations had before it, through trade in elite goods. But given what we have just covered, you might be surprised to learn that there is evidence for two more limited migrations into Britain around this time. The first took place somewhere between the 2nd century and 1st century BC, and is known to us from the writings of Julius Caesar. In his book, The Gallic War, he describes the migration of a group of people known as the Belgi into southern Britain. Originating from somewhere in Belgic Gaul, he describes them as raiders who arrived in modern Hampshire to plunder, only to stay and settle. The second migration, however, is more unusual, and it occurs far away from Gaul along the eastern coast of northern Britain. Dating from the early 4th century BC, the Arras culture of eastern and northern Yorkshire has long provoked controversy amongst archaeologists. Here a series of elite burials have been unearthed characterised by their inclusion of a two-wheeled chariot within a square ditched enclosure. In almost all cases, the occupants of these burials were placed within the body of the chariot, often accompanied by a sword or a mirror. Not only are these features similar to those found in burials in northern France, but the presence of early Latin decorations on these grave goods also hints at a continental origin. Based on these features, it has been theorised these burials represent a migration of a Gallic tribe into Britain, whose distinctive burial practices continued for centuries after their arrival. If this migration did occur, then it was likely more limited than that of the Belgi. Whilst the designs of the grave goods within this tomb have a continental flavour, they are clearly of British manufacture. Moreover, the burials themselves differ from burials on the continent in that the vehicles themselves are often found disassembled, with the exception of three vehicles found at Ferrybridge, Pexton Moor, and a lonely burial outside of Yorkshire at Newbridge in Edinburgh. Excavations of Iron Age buildings within these areas also show continuity with the round houses of the rest of Britain, rather than with the square dwellings common in the rest of Europe. These distinctly British features have even led some archaeologists to suggest that these burials are a form of emulation by the local elites, rather than signs of an invasion. Despite this, the idea of some form of migration remains difficult to dismiss. This possibility is even reflected in the name given by the Romans to the tribes of this area, the Parisi, the same name as that of a Gallic tribe of northern France, whose name is still reflected in that country's capital today. Turning our attention back to trade, we know that by the time these Latin art styles were arriving in Britain, the wider world was becoming more aware of what these distant islands had to offer. 
By the 4th century BC, trade links were growing between southern Britain and the Mediterranean world. The primary form of this trade was in tin, a material that was becoming of increased importance amongst the elite bronzesmiths of the Mediterranean. Perhaps the very first mention of Britain by a foreign writer came within this context. It's not certain, but in his history, Herodotus mentions a set of western islands known as the Cassiterides, the principal source from which ancient Greece received their tin. For a more definite reference, we can turn to authors such as Bephaeus, whose late 4th century BC voyage we covered in our last episode. Whilst his first-hand writings are now lost, excerpts have come down to us from the works of the later Greek author Diodorus of Sicily. In his Bibliotheca Historica, he describes the tin trade of a region known as Balerion, now confirmed to be modern Cornwall. According to Diodorus, the inhabitants would mine the rich alluvial tin, first extracting the ore, then melting it down into small, knuckle-sized ingots for transport. These ingots were then exported via the island of Ictis to Gaul, where they were transported by foot to the southern Greek ports. The exact location of this island of Ictus is difficult to determine. Two major candidates have been mooted, either St Michael's Mount near Penzance, or Mount Batten from Montreux in Plymouth Sound. Archaeologists have even unearthed knuckle-sized pieces of tin from the waters around Mount Batten, though unfortunately for us, they remain undateable. By the late 2nd century BC, maritime trade links between southern Britain and the continent had developed such that we started to see Mediterranean goods arriving in large quantities in British ports. The immediate cause of this was the establishment of the Roman colony of Narbo Martius in southern Gaul around 118 BC. This establishment led in turn to the development of the province of Transalpina, to which eager Roman merchants would have flocked in order to take advantage of new trading opportunities. Soon goods such as Spanish and Italian wine, tableware, figs and black cord and pottery were making their way across Gaul to Brittany, home to southern Britain's strongest trading partners. From here, it only took a short voyage across the Channel for vast quantities of these goods to begin arriving in British ports. Evidence for one of these has been found off the coast of Devon. Here, around the early 1st century BC, the port of Hengisbury Head suddenly came into prominence as a centre of continental trade. Large quantities of Roman wine amphorae have since been excavated, alongside bronze cups and shards of coloured glass. In addition to these Mediterranean goods, shipments of British commodities have also been found at this site, including iron, tin, grain, shale and decorative metals such as gold and silver. Along with neighbouring ports such as Poole Harbour, Green Island and Hamworthy, it seems that Hengisbury Head would have acted as an early form of international distribution centre, from which goods would have made their way further east and west along the coasts of Britain. Here they soon fell into the hands of chieftains and kings alike, giving them their first tastes of the luxuries of Rome. And by this time, these goods will also be accompanied by a new innovation, currency. The first coins appear in the British archaeological record around the beginning of the 2nd century BC. Originating from Belgic Gaul, the first issues, known as Gaelo-Belgic A and B, appeared in quantity throughout the Thames Valley and the southern coastal areas of Britain. Through the next century, another two issues would appear in a more widely dispersed fashion. Minted in gold, these coins were certainly considered high-status items, ones that appear to have been liberally paid out to the Britons by the tribes of the mainland. Rather than being a day-to-day -day currency, it seems likely that these coins would have acted as high-status gifts, perhaps paid out by Belgic tribes to British kings in return for continued trade or military aid. The final issue of these coins, known as Galo Belgic E, dwarfs all those that came before it. It is estimated that it took more than 6,000 kilos of gold to mint, with its payment perhaps being made to secure British help in a war that we will cover shortly. So far on this episode, 
we've talked a lot about elites. We've covered the different types of settlements in Britain and the agricultural innovations that would have shaped individual societies. But what would life have been like for the average man and woman in the first millennium BC? What languages would they have spoken? What gods would they have worshipped? And after they died, how would their remains have been disposed of? Well, the answer to all of the above is it depends on where they lived. There is something of a popular myth that life in Iron Age Britain would have had a common blueprint. Often the people of this time are presented as sharing a common Celtic culture, worshipping the same gods and even speaking the same language. But the truth is that outside of a common family of languages, the cultures and beliefs of these communities would have varied widely. In fact, if we were to transplant a man who lived in Kent during the first century BC to the western shores of Scotland, he may have had no more luck understanding the locals than if he were suddenly expected to converse in Greek or Latin. Even if communication was possible, he would have found that these people knew nothing of mainland Europe, and perhaps would never have heard of the gods that he worshipped. So what can we say in a general sense about the people of late Iron Age Britain? Most of them would have spoken some form of Celtic language, from whose family the modern languages of Welsh, Breton, Cornish, Manx, and both Scottish and Irish Gaelic are ultimately derived. These languages likely developed from existing Indo-European precursors along the Alps of Central Europe, though some dissenters, such as Sir Barry Cunliffe, trace their origin to the Iberian Peninsula. Most of Britain's occupants would still have been farmers or pastoralists, with their farmsteads being either communal or self-contained depending on the region. Outside of elite burials, most people's remains would have been disposed of through a process of exhumation or inhumation, the cremation practices of the Bronze Age having now fallen out of favour. And when it comes to religious practices, that's where things start to get a little complicated. In our last episode, we discussed the emergence of rituals associated with the deposition of large amounts of bronze items throughout the rivers and lakes of Britain. This practice continued in Western Britain until the early Iron Age, until these bronze offerings finally dried up around the mid-7th century BC. But the disappearance of bronze from these hordes didn't mean that they stopped entirely. In fact, there is evidence that centres such as Flag Fen in Cambridgeshire remained active throughout the Iron Age, only abating during the Roman period. And around the mid-5th century BC, iron began to take the place of bronze within these hordes. With this new material also came new religious sites. Signs of one of these Iron Age centres can still be found today in Lincolnshire, near the town of Fiskerton. Here along the edge of the River Witham, a long wooden platform was built around 457 BC. As with Flag Fen, large number of offerings have been found in the area nearby including iron swords and spearheads, along with a large variety of tools. It seems this walkway was refreshed every generation for over a century, and from the quality of the tools deposited here, we can see that the rituals conducted were taken every bit as seriously as their Bronze Age precursors. Sites like Fiskerton have been found throughout the Thames Valley, and it now seems likely that these walkways were common in Britain throughout this time. These walkways are far from the only types of structures from which these depositions would have been made. Many sites would have been far less sophisticated, consisting merely of a convenient rock formation or river bank. This is the case in Flynn Kerrigbach in Anglesey, where a large collection of metalwork has been unearthed, including a set of neck chains that could only have been used to bind captives. And if we broaden our horizon beyond water offerings, we see other signs of ritual worship in Britain. Old trees, unusual rock formations, or large forest groves, all appear to have been places where the gods would have been honoured. Evidence of the latter can still be seen in traces of the Gallic word nemeton, meaning woodland sanctuary, that is incorporated into many place names across Britain. <laughs> 
It has even been suggested that perhaps Britain's most impressive hordes were originally deposited in one of these groves. Found in Norfolk, the Snettisham hordes consist of large deposits of coins, scrap metal and finely crafted torques. Made from different combinations of gold, silver and electrum, these torques represent the pinnacle of native British metalworking and display the sheer wealth available to their crafters, the Iceni. So valuable were these objects, in fact, that it seems ultimately only the gods were allowed to possess them. So what types of gods would have been worshipped at these centres? Going by surviving inscriptions, many of them dating from the Roman period, there seem to have been hundreds of gods in Britain, many of them tied to distinctive places. In addition to these, there also seem to have been specific tribal gods, some of whom lent their name to the peoples who worshipped them. Gods of the underworld are also hinted at by the presence of sacred wells and shaft offerings, such as those found at Willisford in Wiltshire. Sadly, for many of these gods, we now know little more than their names, and what information we do have about them often comes to us by the way of the Romans, who co-opted many native gods upon their arrival in Britain. Examples of this can be found in Bath, where inscriptions can still be found dedicated to the British goddess Solis, who the Romans conflated with their goddess of wisdom, Minerva. A similar example can be found in the north, where the goddess of Britain's largest tribe, the Brigantes, was often conflated with the Roman goddess Victoria. In addition to these homegrown gods, a few international deities are also known to have had cults in Britain, such as Epona, god of horses, the sky god Tyrannus, or Susalus, god of agriculture and wine. With all these different gods to venerate, the spiritual world of Britain would likely have been a confusing place for both the ordinary man and woman to venture. But luckily for them, they didn't have to do so alone. According to the accounts of both Greek and Roman authors, by then the world of gods and spirits had become the domain of another elite group within society, the Druids. The exact nature of the Druids is one that still eludes historians and archaeologists alike to this day. Despite their long history, they left behind no writings of their own, and the few texts that do mention them come to us by the way of foreign authors. The earliest of these accounts are often more sympathetic, casting the Druids in the archetype of the noble savage. But when we examine later Roman accounts by authors such as Caesar, Diodorus of Sicily, and Tacitus, it seems that they were all too eager to attribute to the Druids all manner of atrocities. According to them, the Druids were an elite class within British and Gaulish society, who controlled religious observance and conducted proper sacrifices. In the case of disputes, they were usually called on to act as judges, and to decide appropriate punishments and compensation. According to Pliny, they also had access to vast herbal knowledge, and held a particular reverence for mistletoe and the oaks upon which it grew. If we believe Caesar's account, then they also taught that a person's soul would be reborn in another body after death, a belief they supposedly used to inspire bravery amongst their warriors. Indeed, it seems that to risk the wrath of the Druids was to risk being cut off from the gods entirely, or even becoming an unwilling participant in their rituals. Much has been made of the claims of human sacrifices conducted by the Druids. Both Strabo and Diodorus wrote of ritual killings, whilst Tacitus, writing in the 1st century AD, made similar claims of human sacrifice among the Druids of Anglesey. Quote, it was their religion to drench their altars in the blood of prisoners, and to consult their gods by the means of human entrails. Both Strabo and Caesar describe a similar ritual that was supposedly practiced amongst the Druids of Gaul, wherein wooden cages would be filled with all manner of men and animals, then set alight. According to them, these people were often criminals 
though innocents were sometimes used if supply ran low. So how trustworthy are these accounts? We might be tempted to dismiss these writings as Roman propaganda, but unfortunately there are enough common threads amongst these authors that their claims cannot be dismissed entirely. In an ideal world, we would turn at this point to the archaeological record in order to validate these claims, but unfortunately for us, what evidence we do have is limited. It's true that buildings resembling shrines have been found within the interiors of various hill forts and settlements throughout Britain. A few tantalising items have even been unearthed, such as the proposed divinatory spoons discovered at Crosby Ravensworth in Cumbria. On the whole, however, we currently lack the evidence to say whether Druids existed at all in Britain during this time. But there is one aspect of these authors' accounts about which we can be reasonably certain, and that is that human sacrifice was a reality in Iron Age Britain. Evidence of this has been unearthed at the site of Lindo in Cheshire. Here the well-preserved remains of a man were discovered, bearing the appearance of having undergone a ritual death. First he would have suffered a blow to the head, after which he was first garroted, and then finally had his throat cut. After death, his body was deposited in a bog, perhaps to honour a specific god, or to mark out a tribal boundary. Several similar bodies bearing evidence of ritual wounds have also been recovered from bogs in Ireland, whilst human and animal remains have also been found sealed within grain storage pits in hill forts across southern Britain. Whilst some of these bodies appear to have been carefully placed within the pits after death, others show signs of violent dismemberment, consistent with ritual sacrifice. Perhaps these victims were provided as sacrifices to the gods of the underworld, to ensure that the grain held within these pits remained safe and fertile throughout the long winter months. Whatever the case, it is not too great a leap to equate these practices the Druidic sacrifices reported by Roman authors. If the Druids did exist in Britain, their exact origin point is difficult to determine. One hypothesis is that they emerged during the later Bronze Age, around the same time as the appearance of the warrior elites. Another, more fringe idea is that the roots of this sect date back as far as the arrival of the Beaker culture. As with so much surrounding the Druids, it is unlikely we'll ever know for sure. By the 1st century BC, a recognisable patchwork of tribes had emerged across both Britain and Ireland. Across the southeast, tribes such as the Catuvalani, the Iceni, the Trinovantes, and the Cantai lived in large oppidums and unenclosed settlements. To the west, the Belgi and the Durotriges held sway, whilst in Cornwall the Dumoni would rule in one fashion or another for a millennium to come. Across Wales, tribes such as the Siliers, the Demetai and the Aldovices reigned over a patchwork of small, densely occupied enclosures. In the Midlands, the Dabuni and the Corialtavi held sway, whilst in northern England the tribal confederation of the Brigantes dominated. In Scotland, a multitude of Pictish kingdoms displayed their own distinct set of languages and cultures, whilst across the Irish Sea, four major royal sites were emerging, based around the centres of Tara, Navan, Raff Krogan and Knock Olin. Then, right around the middle point of the 1st century BC, a Roman general makes his first fateful landing into this divided Britain. Caesar had arrived. It would be impossible here to do full justice to the events that brought Julius Caesar to the shores of Kent. Suffice it to say that in the last two decades of his life he had enjoyed an increasingly distinguished military career in both the eastern and the western reaches of Europe. In 60 BC he formed an alliance with the leading politicians Gaius Pompey and Marcus Crassus, and the following year he was elected as consul one of the two chief magistrates of the Roman Republic. At the end of his term in 58 BC, 
he was awarded the governorship of the Roman-controlled areas of southern Gaul. Over the next four years, he would use these provinces as a base to conduct an ambitious war of conquest, ending in the subjugation of the entire region. Now in his mid-forties, he turned his attention across the channel to the mysterious island of Albion. It is difficult to judge Caesar's exact goals for his expeditions to Britain. In his book, The Gallic War, he cites as cause aid given by the British to his enemies in Belgic Gaul. This is certainly a plausible enough reason, but given his success in conquering Gaul, it is difficult to dismiss the idea that Caesar would have harboured similar ambitions for Britain. At the very least, he would have considered the feat a viable act of propaganda, much as he had his expedition across the Rhine earlier in 55 BC. Whatever his intentions, Caesar's first crossing into Rome was delayed by more than a year, first as he dealt with a rebellion by the Veneti of southern Brittany, and then by conflicts with the tribes of Belgic Gaul and Germany. By the time he had mustered the 80 vessels needed to transport two legions across the Channel, it was already late August. The summer was almost over. By his own account, Caesar's knowledge of Britain was limited to what he could gather from the merchants and traders of Gaul, who claimed to know little of what lay beyond the coastline. To learn more of the island, he dispatched a subordinate, Gaius Volusensus, to survey the coastline of Britain. In the meantime, he sent an ambassador in the form of a Gaulish chieftain named Commius, whom the British promptly imprisoned. Faced with this, and the apparent failure of Volusensus to find an appropriate landing spot, Caesar found himself taking a leap into the unknown. Departing from Gaul on the 26th of August 55 BC, he landed somewhere in the vicinity of Deal in Kent. By his account, the British were waiting for him, forcing the Romans to cut their way ashore. The battle was a close-run affair, but it ended in a Roman victory. The local tribes retreated, then sent envoys with offers of allegiance and hostages. This first voyage proved little more than a reconnaissance mission for Caesar. Shortly after his arrival, a storm wrecked many of his ships. Seeing their weakness, the local tribes attacked again, with the battle ending in a narrow Roman victory. Faced now with the prospect of being trapped in Britain over winter, Caesar withdrew across the channel. Even his own carefully presented account can't hide that the venture had nearly been a disaster. When Caesar returned to Britain in the early July of 54 BC, he brought with him a force of an altogether different scale. It consisted of five legions, a force roughly equivalent to 25,000 men, and one supported by over 2,000 cavalry. He also brought with him a new ally in the form of Mandubratius, son of the king of the Trinovantes. After his father's death at the hands of Cassivellanus, king of the neighbouring Catuvellani, he had fled to Caesar's protection, where he would soon prove valuable as a political pawn. This time, he landed unopposed. Advancing quickly into Kent, he fought a series of victorious battles against the local tribesmen. From here, he made his way northwards into the territory of the Catavellani, crossing the River Thames at what was likely the future site of London. He was harried throughout by Cassivellanus's forces, who avoided giving pitched battle. Despite the British campaign of attrition, Caesar would eventually succeed in subjugating the Trinovantes and the other tribes of the area, through whom he learned the location of Cassivellanus's stronghold. The exact modern site of this stronghold remains in dispute to this day, but the most likely sites are either Ravensburg Castle or Devil's Dyke in Hertfordshire. Here Caesar lay siege to the stronghold, and after the defeat of British reinforcements called up from Kent, Cassivellanus had no choice but to offer terms. Caesar secured his usual agreement, an annual tribute was to be sent to Rome, along with hostages. Mandubratius was restored as the king of the now Roman ally Trinovantes, who Cassivellanus agreed to leave in peace. With these favourable terms concluded, 
Caesar returned to Gaul, taking with him a large number of prisoners and ever-growing prestige. Caesar's second expedition to Britain would be his last. By the time he departed these shores, rebellion was already brewing in Belgic Gaul. Caesar would put down this insurrection, but it was merely the prelude to a larger campaign. Led by the king of the Averni, Vercingetorix, this new revolt grew to include most of Gaul, and would threaten to roll back Caesar's conquests before its narrow defeat in 51 BC. Local uprisings would continue over the next two decades, but by the turn of the millennium, Gaul was securely within the grasp of Rome. It would remain that way for another four centuries. It is important that we consider Caesar's invasions of Britain from the perspective of his intended audience. To the citizens of Rome, merely setting foot in Britain would have been a semi-mythical endeavour, akin to the moon landings of the 20th century. The sheer scale of the feat can be seen from the 20 days of thanksgiving ordered by the Senate when news of Caesar's landing arrived. But when it comes to long-term benefits, its legacy is more disputable. It is doubtful that the tribes of southern Britain were meaningfully subjugated, nor was a permanent Roman foothold established across the Channel. Perhaps the most that could be said is that Caesar came away from a perilous adventure with his reputation intact. But in doing so, he also demonstrated to the Roman world that whilst Britain was distant, it was not inaccessible. Famous as Caesar's expeditions to Britain are, it was really his invasion of Gaul that changed everything for the people of southern Britain. There was no way they could have known it at the time, but the arrival of Roman power in northern Europe brought a new player into British politics. Smaller tribes, whose survival had once relied on complex alliances, now had a potential ally sitting across the Channel, whose protection could be secured with a nominal tribute and a few hostages. The more powerful southern tribes may have resented the arrival of this interloper, but even to them, the benefits of Roman trade would have been too good to pass up. As we detailed earlier, Gaul had long been the favoured trading ground of these elites, and its takeover by Rome would have forced them to seek new alliances if they wished to retain their access to luxury goods. Over the next hundred years, this trade would increasingly Romanise large areas of southeastern England, as would the return of hostages educated in Roman manners. By the time Rome turned its attentions back to Britain in the 1st century AD, many of these tribes were already trapped, addicted to the luxury goods that only their continental neighbour could provide. Next time on A History of Britain, the Iron Age comes crashing to an end as the most powerful empire in the world turns its gaze across the Channel. Through a process of divide and conquer, more than half of Britain would soon fall under Roman control. Life on its shores would never be the same again.